Bueno, vamos a 10 segunditos para comenzar. Vamos a ir acomodándonos. Allá en los años 80, en 1990, la mayoría de las personas tenía acceso limitado al Internet. Y recuerdo que inclusive se pagaba por kilobytes, aquellos que son más jovencitos. Increíblemente había que pagar por, por kilobytes. Y había que pagar inclusive por tener una cuenta en Yahoo Mail o si querías más de un, de un mega, 10 mega, 100 mega de, de, de espacio para tu Internet para poder recibir mensajes y enviar mensajes, tenías que pagar por eso. Luego el Internet comenzó una evolución y llegaron diferentes formas de acceder a Internet y llegó Internet básicamente a un costo fijo, gratis en, la, en las eh, bibliotecas, en las escuelas. Ahora tenemos Wi-Fi. Sin embargo, Google hizo un una transformación a lo que conocemos hoy día. E inclusive, hacemos búsquedas en Internet mucho más complejas que antes. Y por ahí una persona muy famosa acuñó la palabra googlear. Todo el mundo googlea por ahí, ¿verdad? Eh, pero ahora, Google no solamente es para buscar información y para entrar a su Internet, sino que ha desarrollado múltiples herramientas sobre todo, y lo más importante quizás, gratuitas. Herramientas para todo, para escribir, para comunicarnos, para eh, tener eh, blogs, etc. Así que, en ese mundo tan interesante, inclusive, Google nos sirve para hacer estadísticas. Y es por eso que el doctor Shin Wu nos va a hablar sobre estas estadísticas de Google. Y para hablarles un poco sobre el doctor, antes de invitarlo a pasar al podio, les comento que el doctor es economista principal de Google y hace 10 años dirige las áreas de inteligencia de negocios, análisis cuantitativo para mercado en línea, proyecciones de ganancias y optimización de las relaciones usuario-anunciante. Ha trabajado también en el desarrollo de modelos macroeconómicos ciclo de vida de un producto, medición de la efectividad del mercado, inferencia causal, diseño de experimentos, entre otros. Antes de trabajar en Google, fue científico principal de GAP, incorporado, donde desarrolló el área de minería de datos y análisis. Con sus análisis lograron desarrollar métricas para determinar tipos de tiendas y productos, tamaños y tipos de empaques, planificación de logista, logística, determinación de precios y manejo de ganancias. Anterior a esto, trabajó como científico principal en Manhattan Associates, donde diseñó algoritmos para el análisis de datos del consumidor, proyecciones de demanda y planificación de inventarios. El doctor Wu posee una maestría en matemáticas aplicadas en la Universidad de Kansas y un doctorado en investigaciones operacionales de Stanford University. En su presentación, nos va a informar más sobre cómo se utilizan las estadísticas en las divisiones de Google. Así que, sin más preámbulo, quiero invitar al doctor Chin Wu que pase al podio, por favor. screen mode, maybe. This could help me. Oh, it is even full screen mode. Uh, Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Hola, uh, my name's Ching, and uh, it's an uh, honor to be in this tropical paradise, even if I had it like, took me 10 hours to get here. But I'm gonna enjoy my weekend here. Um, I just realized that actually there are a lot of students here. Um, I'm really hoping you guys can walk away from this presentation realizing statistics is really a sexy field, and you can find really good job after this, and you're gonna pay very well. So, so my talk is about statistics in Google, and uh, actually there is a quite an evolution of statistics in Google. Um, it didn't start from nowhere. Uh, how many people, people here knew like when Google was founded? 98, that was my first timeline there. So actually, I knew Google actually way before it was founded. We were actually all friends hanging out in Stanford, and little did I know these guys would become so big. And little did I know I would you know, work for my friends. They were my big bosses right now. So Google didn't really hire the first statistician until 2003. My boss, Hal Varian, joined Google as a consultant to work on auction theory in 2002 timeframe. And then we hired two statisticians from AT&T Lab and one from Stanford. In 2004, we started two groups called Ads Quality and Search Quality. Uh, these groups are working on the metrics to, to make the search ads a lot better. And I personally actually joined Google in 2006. In 2007, uh, Hal Varian became my boss, and his official title is Chief Economist. If you ever study the economics, um, more than likely you might use one of his textbooks. Um, the, how many people here have ever heard of Hal Varian? Or very few here, but you should remember him. He's a, he is a really um, uh, important man in the, the field of uh, uh, economics. So in 2009, we had our first a sort of convention within Google for a group, group of statisticians. Uh, we call that StatsFoo, and 50 of us attended. Six years later, now we, we are just about to have the 13th StatsFoo, and there are gonna be like hundreds of us in this meeting, and right now we have more than 1,000 users internally just in this user group called Stats Discuss. Now we have more than five, 600 analysts working across the company. And right now, we also have a session in GSM and published many papers in academic journals. So this is just shows how statistics has become so important in Google. And I'm just gonna showcase how it happened and what kind of problems we're we working on and why it's so important. Also, I wanna correct a few things. In the, in the, Early on, I saw Google slide, but number one, so many things already changed. The logo you saw earlier was no longer our logo. We just released a new logo, if you are aware of that. We have different fonts now. Uh, the second thing, the company's no longer called Google, right? Do you know the new company's name? Alphabet. So Google has gone way beyond just search and advertising. We have a lot more arms, such life science, uh, uh, driverless cars, Google Venture, and all that, all kinds of stuff. So this also shows like, you know, statisticians are also pushing into all these branches as well. So what do statisticians do in Google? This is my sort of classification. I think, roughly speaking, we have two categories of uh, people in Google right now. So the first group people actually are embedded inside product engineering. So these people work very closely with software engineers and building the product together. The second group of people, um, I call them sort of business analysts. They're embedded in separate group of uh, sort of functions and their primary job is to enable this data-driven decision process. So within product engineering side, we have all these different products, right? You can name it, search ads, YouTube, uh, GeoMap, Google Now, Google Play, Consumer Survey, analyt Analytics. So there's a whole suite of products. You know, st statisticians work very closely with software engineers and machine learning people. On the other side, uh, we have sales analytics, quantitative marketing, financial anal analytics, people analytics, uh, quantitative user experiences, this is just understanding the UI, and hardware sales analytics and operation analytics. So there are so many analytics, 
over the business function side. And this side, we hire people from all levels of uh, level, you know, like can be undergrad, master level, and a PhD level. And these people, the requirements are slightly different. You know, not only do we require them to understand math and data, we also want them to present, to understand the business, and to communicate broadly with all different teams. On the left side, um, coding skill is actually very important because not only do you have to get your dance dirty with data, you also have to code in Python, C++, and enable a product quality. So what kind of problems do we work on? So here I'm just giving you a few examples. The problems that we are working on and solving are such a big set right now. So these problems, just the ones I personally probably had in my hands, uh, kind of had, you know, I, I dabbled in. Um, so for example, you know, Google is such a huge company. We get searches every minute, every second. So how we forecast like daily, hourly, our search traffic by countries, by data centers. What's the impact of the weather or recession, the holidays on our revenue? Um, I'm gonna give you some showcase later on about, about that problem. And the other thing is how do you show ads with the best formats? Um, and also, what we are biggest concern is like when people uh, search Google and do we actually develop ad blindness? If, if they don't click the ads, you know, we're gonna lose all our money, right? So we are really watching very closely, trying to measure and understand the shift of ad blindness. And fundamentally, Google makes most money from the advertising. So we really wanna understand, you know, does advertising really work? How effective it is? So that involves a lot of data mining, a lot of statistics. Google now also ventured into what we call the hardware sales world, right? We're selling phones now, we're selling glasses, we're selling probably a bunch of other things in the future. So in these hardware sales world, you know, we want to understand the product life cycle and impact promotions, et cetera. And if you use Google Store or, you know, buy music or buy books, you know, recommendations probably become important the algorithm we are using. And so these just are all like, few samples, in, and the problem is much broader than this, yeah. So what do we use? So I want to point out that Google is really kind of in the cutting edge of the, uh, the, this field right now. So on the left side, you see few circles. Um, I have statistics, I have machine learning, I have econometrics. So in Google, actually, all three communities are intercept with each other. So we're, we don't really necessarily belong to one or the other because we are borrowing techniques and models from all three fields. I think in the past, these three fields don't really communicate that much. If you go to machine learning conference, you rarely see any statisticians. And if you go to econ econ uh, economist meetings, you also don't see them as well. But in Google, we work sort of like right next to each other. So that really enabled a lot of uh, innovations and new techniques being developed. So, the fields of uh, statistics we actually use are pretty much broad. I just point out a few of them on the right-hand side. You know, there's classic st statistics, like, you know, the basic regressions, uh, t-tests, whatever. Learning algorithms. So this is actually the statistics side of the machine learning community. So we are actually um, polish a lot of learning algorithms using the statistical framework. Bayesian. Bayesian's pretty popular right now because the com computational power is, is much bigger right now. So Bayesian is actually uh, very popular in Google. We do a lot of forecasting time series. Uh, we have a lot of geo map data. So we do kind of spatial data analysis and also survey analysis, right? Um, this is probably related to the, the talks you've heard early on. So we do a lot of surveys as well. And causal inferences. Causal inferences usually is, uh, is, a, is a big on uh, econometric site, and we actually start practicing them quite a bit uh, in Google as well. Experiment design, and now we have a new arm, it's a life science, so biostatistics also became uh, a new team within Google. Beyond that, uh, you know, the data infrastructure, the visualization, these are also very, very common things we are practicing uh, in Google as well. All right, that's just kind of general overview about statistics in Google. Uh, right now, I'm actually gonna give you a few more examples uh, about how stats being used and applied in Google. The first is, um, I'm aware, do you guys know how we make money? 
It's often the majority of the money come from the ads, actually from the search ads. So I'm just showing you an example. So if I type uh, hotels in San Juan, this is what you get. So what you see here is like the first three sort of links are, not links, like um, entries are actually hotels with that ad, that little button color there. And uh, on the left side, there's the, what are called right-hand side ads. So whenever people click one of these ads, we make money. So click a lot more ads and help me make more money. <laughs> so um, a lot of people didn't realize how big the money it is here. The reason is because we pretty much make money from all kinds of products and services, not just hotels, right? And if you're looking for insurance program, if you're buying something, you're looking for a party bus, I was looking for my eco tour you know, yesterday, all these industry, you know, all, we make money from all of them. So when they add up from all over the world, it's really big money. So how does it happen? You know, how do we figure out what ad to show there so that you actually click them and, and it doesn't bother you. You know, the worst thing is, you know, people really get annoyed by ads. After a while, you get trained not to click ads anymore, right? So we really had to figure out what's the best way to show ads, not just to make money and really make users happy. So here is our, actually, the basic model we're actually using here. Um, so the uh, auction model we call is called a general second pricing. Uh, this is actually a real well-studied auction model for a long time ago, but Google started to use that um, from 2002. Uh, so the left-hand side, that's the general rules of it. Basically, you order all the ads by the, the bids from the advertisers, and then each ad pays the bid from the second advertiser, the, the guy behind you. So this is a very simple rule from, uh, for this auction model. But since then, uh, we greatly made it a lot more complicated. So I call that modified GSP. That's the current model we are using. And within this model, which notice that there's a lot of uh, signals that relies on statistics or machine learning. So in this model, we are ranking the ads not just by bid, we also based on the click-through rates, you know, how likely the user is gonna click the ad. If people don't like the ad, they might click it, not, you know, they don't click it, then we really want to demote the ads to the lower ranking. And also related to quality sc score and, and the formats of that ad. So it's a much more complicated criteria when we rank the ads. And the pricing now also depends on second bid as, as well as reserve pricing. So the optimization is like, what's the right reserve pricing? I'm pointing out a red entry there. That's the probability of the click-through rates uh, for each impression. It turned out this is the hardest problem to solve. So basically, we want to predict, you know, if I type hotel in San Juan, how likely you are to click the ad, you know, in the, in the three ads I show you there. So it's a, it's a very hard prediction problem because why? You have, because we have billions of different kinds of queries. And also we have many hundreds of millions of different kinds of ads. So you had to predict how likely you're gonna click that ad. So this involves billions of records. This is really a big data in practice. Not only that, we wanna update in the real time. So every minute when you click the ad, we update our model. So basically, I think this is probably the world's largest logistic regression. Basically, we're predicting this probability based on a whole bunch of signals on the right-hand side. These include like query ad sort of pairings, you know, the slots where the ads is, positions, like matching types, et cetera, et cetera. There's like thousands of billions of kind of signals on the right-hand side we're using. In order to make this work, we had to really be innovative to understand how we decompose this traditional logistics regression into um, the way we can, we can paralyze it and we can actually update it in the real time. I believe we published a paper on this, but I'm not entirely sure, but this is one of the key sort of uh, uh, innovation we have in Google to make this happen. I'm showing the, the picture there. This is actually a picture from Google's data center. Google has like hundreds of data centers right now, and each data center is like as big as like 10 different football fields. And so, you know, we have like thousands, or maybe like 10,000 machines cranking all at the same time, just do this uh, uh, logistic regression training. 
The other thing we do a lot is uh, experimentation. So in the online world, you know, doing experiments is so much easier right now. You can basically, you know, while I search, you know, uh, traffic or ads, I can randomize the whole experiment. You know, I can hold 1% of the traffic for experiment, the other 99% traffic uh, for counterfactual sort of studies. So experiment is so much easier online, and we can do all kinds of experiments. In the search and ads world, we can experiment on queries, like each search we can put in the one bucket or the other bucket. We can also sort of experiment on cookies. If you know what cookie is, you know, a cookie is something the server sends to your browser, is, you sort of sit there, and we can do sort of position study. We can understand what you do now versus like 10 days ago, do you change behavior or not? So this is more persisting study we use for, for cookie. We can also do, do geo experiments. You know, for, for US, for example, we can hold in 10 cities for experiments, another 100 cities for counterfactual um, comparisons. We can also do temporal studies. You know, we have AA tests, AB tests, all those stuff. So here's a quote I got from my boss. Apparently in 2010, we ran about 10 thousand experiments, 5,000 search and 5,000 ads, and 400 improvements in search and similar numbers in ads. This is just mind-blowing. I think before Google, nobody has ever done these kind of stuff, just in scale and, 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 and just in numbers. Uh, here, I'm just going to showcase a little bit about this one technique we use to call multi-arm bandits. This is actually based on the Bayesian st uh, statistics. Uh, this whole technique is just based, uh, try to enable a faster, more efficient experiments. Uh, this is actually a feature right now in Google Analytics. Um, basically, I think to go through the details would take much longer time. Um, I'm, ju I'm just going to show you like the whole idea is like when you do experiments, you have uh, many different choices, and the combination of choices is, is there are so many. You know, how do you make sure you can choose the right choice? and not spend too much time in the experiments. Because experiments can be expensive, especially to find the statistical uh, significance for the experiment would take much longer time. So multi-arm bandits is just a one technique to speed up that convergence of experiments. Um, I'm not gonna explain the details right now, just if you're interested in this technique, just do a little Google search and you'll find it out. Google Consumer Survey. This is actually a product we came up with a couple of years ago. This is just the one way to do online survey, much more efficient than people going to the field uh, and fill up a lot of questionnaires. So how does that work? It turned out a lot of publishers we have, right? There's a paywall. In order to read an article in Wall Street Journal, you had to pay something, you had to be subscribers. And it just turned out, you know, in order to, for people to read that, Maybe they don't need to pay anything. They can just answer a few questions, and then they can read that uh, article. So this creates an incentive for people to answer questions, and also hopefully answer the questions truthfully. So this is just an example. We have a pop-up window. Somebody wants to read this uh, article in Christian Science, then we have this one screen popping out. Say, should the US government raise the debt ceiling? So you can quickly answer yes or no, and we collect the stats and do a very, very quick survey. Now you can see how efficient this can be. We can reach like 10,000 people within an hour all over the country, or sometimes all over the world, depends on how we wrote out this product. But then there's a lot of questions that may come up because is this biased? Do people lie? So it turned out we can play all kind of uh, statistical tricks uh, to correct these answers. This is just a... Uh, uh, idea how it works. So this scheme not really just helps the publishers to make more money because what happened is like I want to do a survey, I pay money to Google, and each question right now only costs like each survey only costs like ten cents. It's so much cheaper than sending people to the field. And then in the meantime, the publishers also get a cut because they don't make much money from the ads on the page these days, you know, 10 cents or like a cut of 10 cents, still much more profitable uh, than showing ads in their content site. So this scheme really just worked for both sides. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great scheme. So as I said, there are a lot of statistics we actually use to correct the answer and make sure it is uh, meaningful. 
Uh, these are just a set of uh, techniques we use. Uh, right now, we are actually making it much more comp uh, complicated. And we actually also have a ground truth to validate this method. Uh, for example, we, we know exactly how many people own dogs in the US. And it turned out our survey results really match that numbers. So there's a lot of ground truth we use to validate it. And it turned out pretty good. But once again, you still have to, have to be a little bit careful because the, uh, there, there are some, sometimes there are bias you, you, it's very hard to get rid of. Um, right now, we wrote this product to at least eight countries right now. I think there's six more countries in the pipeline. So hopefully, uh, you know, people all over the world can, can use this tool to, 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 uh, to do easy online surveys. All right. Um, just now, I was just giving you a few, like, flavor of what stats can do in Google. Um, my, my second part of the presentation might get a little bit technical for high school students, <laughs> but just uh, bear in mind, this just is a fun thing. Um, so in Google, we have a lot of data. So we do, a, we do a lot of regressions, but our challenge for regressions is that we have a lot of uh, predictors on the right-hand side, you know. So the challenge is how do you find right predictors? How do you select the right variables? So the, the second part, I'm going to showcase three examples that we, we can use different techniques to, to do that job. So I'm listing a few things here. So in, uh, in the practice, most people, what they do is, if they have so many predictors, they use human judgment to figure out which ones are right. And then they start to do more statistic techniques. The most common classic one is the stepwise regression. So if you st study stats, you know the stepwise. You know, in R is step. Um, the other thing is the dimension uh, reduction techniques, like principal components. Uh, you can do PCA and reduce the dimensions as well. Now, here comes the machine learning stuff. Um, Google has thousands of machine learning people. Um, machine learning community is actually really, really big right now, right? Within machine learning, there's many subfields, such as uh, image recognition, uh, natural language processing, and text mining. These are subfields within machine learning. Um, we actually, the statistician, uh, statistician community is slightly different from them, but we actually interact with them and trying to learn these techniques from them and apply them to, to our jobs as well. Like techniques like a bagging and bo um, boosting, and cross validation, these techniques right now are much common now uh, for the stats community. So I'm going to show you how we use some of the learning, learning techniques to do our variable selection. And then finally, uh, the Bayesian. Bayesian is a, a very buzzword, very hot. So we also have Bayesian techniques to do the variable selection as well. And I'm going to show you how we use that. The first one, actually, uh, this is what I became famous for in Google. Um, so they, they call me the weatherman of Google. The reason is that uh, back in 2007, this is a long time ago, I kind of became aware that weather actually has had big impact on people's search behavior. Uh, California is kind of like Puerto Rico, you know, it's always warm, so we don't care about the sun, we're pretty happy. But if you live in Germany, uh, it just turned out if it's very sunny, uh, warm, in spring and summertime, everybody's out, nobody's doing anything. So that turned out has a huge impact on Google's uh, search traffic and search revenue. So on a Sunday, clear day in summer in Germany, we can lose 20% traffic. Not kidding, just because people don't want to work. And so now my task is like trying to understand exactly what impact, how to quantify that impact for our search traffic. The problem here is, this is actually my interview question for the longest time, I don't do that anymore. So I, I told them, I give you guys two time series. You know, one is the black line, which is the search traffic, daily traffic. The red line is the maximum temperature for, for that particular country or city. So I'm gonna ask you, how do you find out, you know, if my temperature is hotter or warmer, what's the impact on search traffic? Is that 10% less or 5% more? Just, just model it and tell me how to do this. Two time series. It just turned out, actually, this model, there are many ways to solve this problem, and the simplest model is actually the most effective one. So all I did here is I'm doing week over week difference, scatter plot. You know, x-axis is actually the temperature difference between this Monday and last Monday, and the 
y-axis is actually the traffic differences between these two days as well. And you do the scatter plot by month from January all the way to um, December. This is one of the small European countries. And also, I colored the points differently be between work days and non-work days. And then I can start to see the pattern. So visualization, these kind of visualization really help you to understand the relationship and help you build the model. So after doing this scatter plot, the model became very, very simple. So basically, I ran this difference to difference um, um, regression and with many different kind of variables on the right hand side. This includes temperatures, rain or, rain or snow or not. And then let stepwise regression to take care of these regression and figure out whether there's any difference between workday or non-workday, January or, or December. Very simple model, and it, it worked like perfectly. So right now, so every day in the morning, there's a Chrome job in my, in my server. I, I create this, what I call weather dashboard. So weather dashboard calculates, uh, estimate exactly what's the weather's impact on Google, in Google, um, for Google like for search, for revenue. So if we make money like 3% less than what we predicted yesterday, I would say 2% is due, due to weather. 1% is due to something else. It might be noise. So it really helps us to monitor very closely how our performance is doing and also understand exactly what's causing what. So this chart is kind of an example for my weather dashboard. And there are three lines here. Basically, I'm just pointing out there's actually differences between different devices. Uh, it turned out, of course, if you are using desktop or tablet, it's, it's affected by weather a lot more. But if you're using uh, mobile, you know, you carry mobile devices everywhere. It's, it's 24 by 7 thing. So the red line is, is the impact for mobile. It just turned out to be a lot smaller. So all these mathematical results really match our intuition. It just demonstrate how powerful statistics and math models can be. Great. Second set of problems we're trying to solve. This is actually um, uh, published uh, a couple years ago. Uh, basically, we are trying to use Google search trends to understand economy, uh, what's going on. Um, unfortunately, I didn't run the study for Puerto Rico. I think it would be interesting. Um, so what you see here is actually we have uh, two product in uh, Google, you can access yourself, just Google it. One is called Google Trends, the other thing is called Google Correlate. So in Google Trends, you can type a query and you can see how the search trends is like for your country or for any uh, geo over the time. And Google Correlate, what does that do is you can actually upload a time series and it will tell you what search trends correlate very well with that query. So example here is actually the, what we call initial claims. So in US, we have this uh, metric called initial claims. It comes out every end of uh, Friday. Basically, a lot of investors, bankers, and, and really watch closely of this number because it kind of tells you how many people are um, become unemployed and uh, you know, how poorly or, or great you know, the economy is performing. So it's a, it's a weekly metric. So what you see here, the red line, is actually our um, weekly uh, claim number uh, for the last eight years. And it just turned out, if you do Google Correlate, it's correlated very well with uh, a query called unemployment. Makes sense. What that means, like, when people get, you know, get fired or laid off, they will look for unemployment, unemployment benefits right away. So that metric turns out to be very correlated with the initial claims. So the idea is, you know, can we use Google Query Trends to predict or now cast uh, this predictor, you know, better? Actually, the reason that I'm here today is because I ran into one of your professors, Roberto. Is Roberto here? Not here. Offside. Offside. Yeah, he actually was working on a problem trying to use the uh, uh, holiday search queries to predict uh, or now cast the query trends in the Puerto Rico hotel, resi residential hotel, uh, um, I think a residence hotel attendances or uh, fill rates. So it's the same idea. He probably borrowed from here, but trying to use different models. So how do we do that? So basically, uh, what we're trying to do is to use Google query trends and also use some external variables 
and then to now cast a predict economic index. Um, once again, this is getting way too more technical than probably most audience here. Um, but I just want to point out there's a technique developed within Google. It's called uh, BSTS. It's a Bayesian Structure Time Series. So it combined uh, some time series techniques with uh, the Bayesian um, sort of mentality into that. So we, we can decompose the time series into many different components. And they have different levels. And then we do inferences using the MCMC draws. Uh, the selections actually use uh, what we call a spike, slap, uh, spike and a slap selection. Uh, this is based on kind of shoe horse type of uh, uh, prior uh, models for each vari variable. Um, or not, actually not horseshoe, it's just like a, a point sort of prior distribution for, for each variable and then we do inferences to select them. So there's a very different way to select variable than the traditional sort of stepwise way. I'm going to speak this. So basically, we can decompose the time series into different components. You know, these components are very hairy. So because decomposition is done in a in a Bayesian way, that there's distribution for each point. Once again, this is this is very Bayesian, uh, very different from the classic technique. In the end, we can actually figure out, you know, when we do the selection, uh, what's the exact probability for each variable to be included in the model. So, for example, when we ran this model, we find out like queries such as employment office, find for employment. These queries should be in the model. They have very high sort of inclusion probability. Uh, it turned out there's another one called serious internet. For some reason, they're also in the model, but their inclusion probability is much lower. Just showcase like the performance is better than the traditional model. So last case I'm going to showcase is actually the flu trend. Unfortunately, we just deprecate this uh, flu trend like this year. But this is actually based on the paper published uh, in Science, at least in 2008, 2009 timeframe. So for five years, we actually have a, a page in Google to show you what the flu is like in your area, especially, you know, say in San Juan, is there a flu going on or not? So how do we do that? It just turned out to be whenever people have a lot of symptoms, you know, they have flu symptoms, they go to Google to search for uh, medicines. Uh, they, they were typing symptoms, you know, trying to find out what's going on. So we can actually use the trends of these uh, symptoms or drugs, whatever it is, to construct these uh, trends to monitor the flu in all of the world and, and also in the small regions as well. So the challenge here is that Google has so many queries, or we have billions of queries, you know. Uh, the ground truth actually came from CDC data. CDC, this is the Center of Disease Control, have these flu trend data, but it's always like delayed by three or four weeks. But at least we can use that as ground truth to train the model. And the challenge is how do you find a right query set? You know, there's so many different queries. So basically, uh, we experiment several models to try to figure out to select these right queries out of like millions of them to, to build the models and then to fit the model, make sure the flu trend in your area is correct. And the model we actually end up with in the right before deprecation was actually turned out to be a, a very much a popular learning model called ElasticNet. So this is a basic formulation of uh, uh, you know, regularization for regressions. So in the, this is a traditional regular, regularization and we, sorry, traditional regression, we add two components. One is the uh, square, the distance, one is actually the absolute value. And depends on these two components, there are three different methods. Actually, uh, this is all developed in the last 20 years. You know, one is called Ridge, one is called Lasso, one, one is called ElasticNet. And uh, we actually compare all, all different methods, and this is just a chart showing like the performances, and to find out that ElasticNet is the, uh, the, the best one. So if you're interested in uh, statistical learning, especially regularization, uh, there, there's a lot of literature on, on you know, Lasso, ElastinNet, or which one's good, which one's bad, why it's good, why it's bad. And it's a very fascinating uh, sort of uh, set of literature. Now, these techniques are used much more commonly right now in the industry and, and also in many application fields. Um, it's, hard in, it's hard for interpretation, but at the same time, the, they really help to predict, uh, help the prediction. Yeah. Anyway, so 
you know, I only have 40 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, and there's so much I can talk about. So, I, but so far, I just gave you a few small a few examples. Uh, I'm going to conclude this with a, a, a title, a tagline called Big Data, Big Computing Power, and Big Opportunities. So one of the two things that's really unique to, to the environment, to Google, is when one, we have so much data, you know, it's like a billions number of uh, billions, billions of records. The other thing is we have a, such a great computing power. We have a data center with thousands, 10,000 machines that all can run at the same time. So this really are pushing our statistics to new frontier. So I'm just pointing out sort of future directions we are, we are currently working on. Number one thing is I call parallelization. So a lot of classic algorithms is a single thread. It's not parallelized. Right now, we spend a lot of time parallelizing the algorithms so they can run in 10,000 machines all at the same time, speed up the uh, convergence, right? So all kinds of classic algorithms right now can be parallelized you know, using some uh, techniques. And the other is called Bayesianization. You know, a lot of, once again, a lot of algorithms have a Bayesian version of it. Uh, we feel Bayesian versions are just more rigorous, and, uh, and so there's a lot of algorithms we are, we are making them Bayesian. Third thing is, we spend a lot of time understanding advertising effectiveness and attrition. This is kind of down to probably Nielsen's uh, turf, uh, because we really try, you know, these days you're exposed to so many TVs, billboards, um, Facebook ads, Google ads, we try to understand when you do the final transaction, what cost it? Where does that come from? Is that due to TV? Is it due to billboards or due to Gmail or mail or whatever? So this is an unsolved problem. I think it's really, really hard. But you know, a lot of teams are working on that. I'm sure Nielsen's working on that as well. The fourth field, actually, I'm kind of in the middle of this, is about causal inferences and learning. So this is combining sort of classic um, econometrics community with the learning community and trying to understand how we're going to draw causal inferences to, to a, a whole bunch of problems such as advertiser, retention, engagement, acquisition. There's a lot of problems that we, we can't figure out. It's correlation. It's not causal. How do you figure out it is causal? You know, using randomized experiments or using sort of natural experiments. So there's a lot of new techniques being developed right now to understand that. But finally, Google has a lot of spatial data, like from map, from Earth, from GPS data, from Zoom, you know, driverless car, we drive cars, cars can get a lot of data from the roads, and from the balloons, from the Loom, you, you guys heard about Loom, it's a balloon project, you know, in the atmosphere, and from fiber, so Google are actually um, trying to develop these uh, fiber optic infrastructure all over the U.S. So these data are become very, the very geo kind of related data. So we are actually working on sort of spatial temporal sort of uh, framework for, for all these kind of projects. So we, we're trying to uh, cross pollinate, yeah. So once again, themes are big data, big computing power, and also uh, cross uh, pollinization because we have people from very different fields working very next to each other, which, which is harder to find in academia because people, you know, communities are more, more separate. Anyway, so this pretty much ends my uh, presentation. And uh, if you have any questions, you know, you can ask me now or a little after. And basically, I want to point out there's a, there's a bright future for anyone who's interested in big data uh, and the big statistics. And I'm hoping all the young people can join us. Hi, great presentation. Question, when, uh, when Google is collecting queries uh, to do their analytics, are, are you selecting only English language queries or do multiple language queries start uh, piling in? Any language right now, but we have a certain kind of threshold because uh, privacy is our primary concern. You can imagine some of the very long tail queries, uh, people can infer something private from there, so we don't give that trend. But like more high frequency, high volume queries, you can definitely get that, yeah. Hi. Uh, what type of method do you use for optimizing your search engine for the thousand or tsunami of data requests that you well, have? If, in, in back the, in the days in 95, I think 96-ish, uh, you know, Larry and Page came out with PageRank. That was the uh, earliest algorithm. But since then, you know, Google has improved so much more on that. So that's our core competence. You know, I can't tell you, I actually don't know personally how complicated it has got. The ranking algorithm is, is so complicated right now, yeah? But page rank was really how it started. Do you have any type of redundancy for your data centers? A redundancy? Yeah, for your data centers. You know, if one data centers go off, 
you know, how, how you supply that, that uh, problem? I just, actually, I actually didn't understand the redundancy question. Um, you mean one doesn't? A redundancy within your data centers. You know, if one data center go off, what's your oh, backup oh, for you that? Mean, oh, yes, uh, we have a lot of replicates. So all the data center, you know, replicate each other, so there's a high availability, right? Basically, we guarantee uh, 24 by 7 services, yeah. There's a lot of backup. Yeah, actually, we have a huge infrastructure team just to try to figure out how to reroute the traffic, you know, from all over the data center, and it's still guarantee you can get your search result in a, in a millisecond. So there's actually a lot of statistics also done in that field as well. I'm, I'm not even putting there, yeah. The last one, you mentioned that it took you around 10 hours to get here. You were using Google Maps? <laughs> I used Google Maps to get here from San Juan. <laughs> so we have, yeah, the traffic optimization, Waze. Have you guys, have you guys used Waze yet? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's actually developed uh, in Israel, and it's just another map app. And there's also a lot of big data money in that app as well, yeah. All right, especially students, if you want to ask me questions after. Sí. OK, un aplauso, por favor. <laughs> Thank you. Bueno, eso termina la sesión de la mañana. Vamos a pasar al almuerzo. Para eso, pueden subir las escaleras y tomar el pasillo que me queda a mi derecha, arriba. Hay ujieres que los van a estar guiando en el proceso. Así que, buen provecho.